Chapter forty five of the Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which Tom Pinch and his sister take a little pleasure, but quite in a domestic way, and with no ceremony about it. Tom Pinch and his sister, having to part for the dispatch of the morning's business, immediately after the dispersion of the other actors in the scene upon the wharf, with which the reader has been already made acquainted, had no opportunity of discussing the subject at that time. But Tom, in his solitary office, and Ruth in the triangular parlour, thought about nothing else all day, and when their hour of meeting in the afternoon approached, they were very full of it, to be sure. There was a little plot between them that Tom should always come out of the temple by one way, and that was past the fountain. Coming through Fountain Court, he was just to glance down the steps leading into Garden Court, and to look once all around him, and if Ruth had come to meet him there, he would see her. Not sauntering, you understand, on account of the clerks, but coming briskly up, with the best little laugh upon her face that ever played in opposition to the fountain, and beat it all to nothing. For fifty to one, Tom had been looking for her in the wrong direction, and had quite given her up while she had been tripping towards him from the first jingling that little reticule of hers, with all the keys in it, to attract his wandering observation. Whether there was life enough left in the slow vegetation of Fountain Court, for the smoky shrubs to have any consciousness of the brightest and purest-hearted little woman in the world, is a question for gardeners, and those who are learned in the loves of plants. But that was a good thing, for that same paved yard to have such a delicate little figure flitting through it, that it passed like a smile from the grimy old houses and the worn flagstones, and left them duller, darker, sterner than before. There is no sort of doubt. The temple fountain might have leaped up twenty feet to greet the spring of hopeful maidenhood that in her person stole on, sparkling through the dry and dusty channels of the law, the chirping sparrows, bred in temple chinks and crannies, might have held their peace to listen to imaginary skylarks as so fresh a little creature passed. The dingy boughs, unused to droop, otherwise than in their puny growth, might have bent down in a kindred gracefulness to shed their benedictions on her graceful head. Old love-letters, shut up in iron boxes, in the neighbouring offices, and made of no account among the heaps of family papers into which they had strayed, and of which, in their degeneracy, they formed a part, might have stirred and fluttered with a moment's recollection of their ancient tenderness, as she went lightly by. Anything might have happened that did not happen, and never will, for the love of Ruth. Something happened, too, upon the afternoon of which the history treats. Not for her love, oh no, quite by accident, and without the least reference to her at all. Either she was a little too soon, or Tom was a little too late. She was so precise in general that she timed it to a half-minute. But no Tom was there. Well, but was anybody else there, that she blushed so deeply? after looking round, and tripped off down the steps with such unusual expedition. Why, the fact is that Mr. Westlock was passing at that moment. The temple is a public thoroughfare. They may write up on the gates that it is not, but so long as the gates are left open, it is, and will be, and Mr. Westlock had as good a right to be there as anybody else. But why did she run away, then? Not being ill-dressed, for she was much too neat for that. Why did she run away? The brown hair that had fallen down beneath her bonnet, and had one impertinent imp of a false flower clinging to it, boastful of its license before all men. That could have not been the cause, for it looked charming. Oh, foolish, panting, frightened little heart, why did she run away? Merrily the tiny fountain played, and merrily the dimple sparkled on its sunny face. John Westlock hurried after her. Softly the whispering water broke and fell as roguishly as the dimples twinkled, as he stole upon her footsteps. Oh, foolish, panting, timid little heart, why did she feign to be unconscious of his coming? Why wish herself so far away, yet be so flutteringly happy there? I felt sure it was you, said John, when he overtook her in the sanctuary of Garden Court. I knew I couldn't be mistaken. She was so surprised. You're waiting for your brother, said John. Let me bear you company. So light was the touch of the coy little hand, that he glanced down to assure himself that he had it on his arm. But his glance, stopping for an instant at the bright eyes, forgot its first design, and went no further. 
they walked up and down three or four times speaking about tom and his mysterious employment now that was a very natural and innocent subject surely then why whenever ruth lifted up her eyes did she let them fall again immediately and seek the uncongenial pavement of the court they were not such eyes as shun the light they were not such eyes as to require to be hoarded to enhance their value they were much too precious and too genuine to stand in need of arts like those somebody must have been looking at them they found out tom though quickly enough this pair of eyes descried him in the distance the moment he appeared he was staring about him as usual in all directions but the right one and was as obstinate in not looking towards them as if he had intended it as it was plain that being left to himself he would walk away home john westlock darted off to stop him this made the approach of poor little ruth by herself one of the most embarrassing of circumstances there was tom manifesting extreme surprise he had no presence of mind that tom on small occasions there was john making as light of it as he could but explaining at the same time with most unnecessary elaboration and here was she coming towards him with both of them looking at her conscious of blushing to a terrible extent but trying to throw up her eyebrows carelessly and pout her rosy lips as if she were the coolest and most unconcerned of little women merrily the fountain plashed and plashed until the dimples merging into one another swelled into a general smile that covered the whole surface of the basin what an extraordinary meeting said tom i should never have dreamed of seeing you two together here quite accidental john was heard to murmur exactly cried tom that's what i mean you know if it wasn't accidental there would be nothing remarkable in it uh, to be sure said john such an out-of-the-way place for you to have met in pursued tom quite delighted such an unlikely spot john rather disputed that on the contrary he considered it a very likely spot indeed he was constantly passing to and fro there he said he shouldn't wonder if it were to happen again his only wonder was that it had never happened before by this time ruth had got round on the farther side of her brother and had taken his arm she was squeezing it now as much as to say are you going to stop here all day you dear old blundering tom tom answered the squeeze as if it had been a speech john he said if you will give my sister your arm we'll take her between us and walk on i have a curious circumstance to relate to you our meeting could not have happened better merrily the fountain leapt and danced and merrily the smiling dimples twinkled and expanded more and more until they broke into a laugh against the basin's rim and vanished tom said his friend as they turned into the noisy street i have a proposition to make it is that you and your sister if she will so far honour a poor bachelor's dwelling give me a great pleasure and come and dine with me what to-day cried tom yes to-day it's close by you know pray miss pinch insist upon it it will be very disinterested for i have nothing to give you oh you must not believe that ruth said tom he is the most tremendous fellow in his housekeeping that i ever heard of for a single man he ought to be lord mayor well what do you say shall we go if you please tom rejoined his dutiful little sister but i mean said tom regarding her with smiling admiration is there anything you ought to wear and haven't got i am sure i don't know john she may not be able to take her bonnet off for anything i can tell there was a great deal of laughing at this and there were diverse compliments from john westlock not compliments he said at least and really he was right but good plain honest truths which no one could deny ruth laughed and all that but she made no objection so it was an engagement if i had known it a little sooner said john i would have tried another pudding not in rivalry but merely to exalt that famous one i wouldn't on any account have made it with suet why not asked tom because that cookery book advises suet said john westlock and ours was made with flour and eggs oh good gracious cried tom ours was made with flour and eggs was it <laughs> a beefsteak pudding made with flour and eggs why nobody knows better than that i know better than that <laughs> it is unnecessary to say that tom had been present at the making of the pudding and had been a devoted believer in it all through but he was so delighted to have this joke against his busy little sister and was tickled to the degree that having found her out that he stopped in temple bar to laugh and it was no more to tom than he was anathematized and knocked about by the surly passengers than it would have been to a post for he continued to exclaim with unabated good humour flour and eggs a beefsteak pudding made with flour and eggs until john westlock and his sister fairly ran away from him and let him have his laugh out by himself which he had 
and then came dodging across the crowded street to them with such sweet temper and tenderness it was quite a tender joke of tom's beaming in his face god bless it that it might have purified the air though temple bar had been as in the golden days gone by embellished with a row of rotting human heads there are snug chambers in those inns where the bachelors live and for the desolate fellows they pretend to be it is quite surprising how well they get on john was very pathetic on the subject of his dreary life and the deplorable makeshifts and apologetic contrivances it involved but he really seemed to make himself pretty comfortable his rooms were the perfection of neatness and convenience at any rate and if you were anything but comfortable the fault was certainly not theirs he had no sooner ushered tom and his sister into his best room where there was a beautiful little vase of fresh flowers on the table all ready for ruth just as if he had expected her tom said then seizing his hat he bustled out again in his most energetically bustling way and presently came hurrying back as they saw through the half-open door attended by a fiery-faced matron attired in a crunch bonnet with particularly long strings to it hanging down her back in conjunction with whom he instantly began to lay the cloth for dinner polishing up the wine-glasses with his own hands brightening the silver top of the pepper caster on his coat sleeve drawing corks and filling decanters with a skill and expedition that were quite dazzling as if in the course of this rubbing and polishing he had rubbed an enchanted lamp or a magic ring obedient to which there were twenty thousand supernatural slaves at least suddenly there appeared a being in a white waistcoat carrying under his arm a napkin and attended by another being with an oblong box upon his head from which a banquet piping hot was taken out and set upon the table salmon lamb peas innocent young potatoes a cool salad sliced cucumber a tender duckling and a tart all there they all came at the right time where they came from didn't appear but the oblong box was constantly going and coming and making its arrival known to the man in the white waistcoat by bumping modestly against the outside of the door for after its first appearance it entered the room no more he was never surprised this man never seemed to wonder at the extraordinary things he found in the box but took them out with a face expressive of a steady purpose and impenetrable character and put them on the table he was a kind man gentle in his manners and much interested in what they ate and drank he was a learned man and knew the flavour of john westlock's private sources which he softly and feelingly described as he handed the little bottles round he was a grave man and a noiseless for dinner being done and wine and fruit arranged upon the board he vanished box and all like something that had never been didn't i say he was a tremendous fellow in his housekeeping cried tom bless my soul it's wonderful ah miss pinch said john this is the bright side of the life we lead in such a place it would be a dismal life indeed if it didn't brighten up to-day don't believe a word he says cried tom he lives here like a monarch and wouldn't change his mode of life for any consideration he only pretends to grumble no john really did not appear to pretend for he was uncommonly earnest in his desire to have it understood that he was as dull solitary and uncomfortable on ordinary occasions as an unfortunate young man could in reason be it was a wretched life he said a miserable life he thought of getting rid of the chambers as soon as possible and meant in fact put up a bill very shortly well said tom pinch i don't know where you can go john to be more comfortable that's all i can say what do you say ruth ruth trifled with the cherries on her plate and said she thought mr westlock ought to be quite happy and she had no doubt he was ah foolish panting frightened little heart how timidly she said it but you are forgetting what you had to tell tom what occurred this morning she added in the same breath so i am said tom we have been so talkative on other topics that i declare i have not had time to think of it i'll tell you at once john in case i should forget it altogether on tom's relating what had passed upon the wharf his friend was very much surprised and took such a great interest in the narrative as tom could not quite understand he believed he knew the old lady whose acquaintance they had made he said and that he might venture to say from their description of her that her name was gamp but of what nature the communication could have been which tom had borne so unexpectedly why its delivery had been entrusted to him how it happened that the parties were involved together and what secret lay at the bottom of the whole affair perplexed him very much tom had been sure of his taking some interest in the matter 
but was not prepared for the strong interest he showed it held john westlock to the subject even after ruth had left the room and evidently made him anxious to pursue it further than as a mere subject of conversation i shall remonstrate with my landlord of course said tom though he is a very singular sort of man and not likely to afford me much satisfaction even if he knew what was in the letter which you may swear he did john interposed you think so i am certain of it well said tom i shall remonstrate with him when i see him he goes in and out in a strange way but i will try and catch him to-morrow morning on his having asked me to execute such an unpleasant commission and i have been thinking john that if i went down to mrs what's her names in the city where i was before you know mrs todgers to-morrow morning i might find poor mercy pecksniff there perhaps and be able to explain to her how i came to have any hand in the business you are perfectly right tom returned his friend after a short interval of reflection you cannot do better it is quite clear to me that whatever the business is there is little good in it and it is so desirable for you to disentangle yourself from any appearance of wilful connection with it that i would counsel you to see her husband if you can and wash your hands of it by a plain statement of the facts i have a misgiving that there is something dark at work here tom i will tell you why another time when i have made an inquiry or two myself all this sounded very mysterious to tom pinch but as he knew he could rely upon his friend he resolved to follow this advice ah but it would have been a good thing to have had a coat of invisibility wherein to have watched little ruth when she was left to herself in john westlock's chambers and john and her brother were talking thus over their wine the gentle way in which she tried to get up a little conversation with the fiery-faced matron in the crunched bonnet who was waiting to attend her after making a desperate rally in regard of her dress and attiring herself in a washed-out yellow gown with sprigs of the same upon it so that it looked like a tessellated work of pats of butter that would have been pleasant the grim and griffin-like inflexibility with which the fiery-faced matron repelled these engaging advances as proceeding from a hostile and dangerous power who could have no business there unless it were to deprive her of a customer or to suggest what became of the self-consuming tea and sugar and other general trifles that would have been agreeable the bashful winning glorious curiosity with which little ruth when fiery face was gone peeped into the books and knick-knacks that were lying about and had a particular interest in some delicate paper matches on the chimney-piece wondering who could have made them that would have been worth seeing the faltering hand with which she tied those flowers together with which almost blushing at her own fair self as imaged in the glass she arranged them in her breast and looking at them with her head aside now half resolved to take them out again now half resolved to leave them where they were that would have been delightful john seemed to think it all delightful for coming in with tom to tea he took his seat beside her like a man enchanted and when the tea service had been removed and tom sitting down at the piano became absorbed in some of his old organ tunes he was still beside her at the open window looking out upon the twilight there is little enough to see in furnival's inn it is a shady quiet place echoing to the footsteps of the stragglers who have business there and rather monotonous and gloomy on summer evenings what gave it such a charm to them that they remained at the window as unconscious of the flight of time as tom himself the dreamer while the melodies which had so often soothed his spirit were hovering again about him what power infused into the fading light the gathering darkness the stars that here and there appeared the evening air the city's hum and stir the very chiming of the old church clocks such exquisite enthrallment that the divinest regions of the earth spread out before their eyes could not have held them in captive in a stronger chain the shadows deepened deepened and the room became quite dark still tom's fingers wandered over the keys of the piano and still the window had its pair of tenants at length her hand upon his shoulder and her breath upon his forehead roused tom from his reverie dear me he cried desisting with a start i am afraid i have been very inconsiderate and unpolite tom little thought how much consideration and politeness he had shown sing something for us my dear said tom let us hear your voice come john westlock added his entreaties with such earnestness that a flinty heart alone could have resisted them hers was not a flinty heart oh dear no quite another thing so down she sat and in a pleasant voice began to sing the ballads tom loved well 
old rhyming stories with here and there a pause for a few simple chords such as a harper might have sounded in the ancient time while looking upwards for the current of some half-remembered legend words of old poets wedded to such measures that the strain of music might have been the poet's breath giving utterance and expression to his thoughts and now a melody so joyous and light-hearted that the singer seemed incapable of sadness until in her inconstancy a oh, wicked little singer she relapsed and broke the listeners hearts again these were the simple means she used to please them and that these simple means prevailed and she did please them let the still darkened chamber and its long deferred illumination witness the candles came at last and it was time for moving homeward cutting paper carefully and rolling it about the stalks of those same flowers occasioned some delay but even this was done in time and ruth was ready good night said tom a memorable and delightful visit john good night john thought he would walk with them no no don't said tom what nonsense we can get home very well alone i couldn't think of taking you out but john said he would rather are you sure you would rather said tom i'm afraid you only say so out of politeness john being quite sure gave his arm to ruth and led her out fiery face who was again in attendance acknowledged her departure with a cold curtsey that it was hardly visible and cut tom dead the host was bent on walking the whole distance and would not listen to tom's dissuasions happy time happy walk happy parting happy dreams but there are some sweet day dreams so there are that put visions of the night to shame busily the temple fountain murmured in the moonlight while ruth lay sleeping with her flowers beside her and john westlock sketched a portrait whose from memory End of chapter 45